it's never. It's it's funny because I mean I even see this among a lot of people who um, call themselves tolerant. One of my, I guess the, the first time I really felt the sting of this it was actually in a gender studies class. Mm -hmm. It's probably the most tolerant liberal group of people, all condensed into one area. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about um, discrimination and how you, what what prism you shoot it through. And I'm a heterosexual white male. Mm -hmm. What do I shoot my um, my empathy through? What is it that that I see in other people that I can see in myself? And my atheism was it. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I announced that to the class, I might as well have been asking for donations to Al-Qaeda. <laughs> I mean, there's a chill that went through the room, mm -hmm. and everyone was staring at their shoes, and there was this sense of, will this guy please just shut up? Mm -hmm. Where, to me, um, that feeling there, it's very easy for me to project that on how somebody else could feel it being excluded. Mm -hmm. And this, again, was a very, very progressive group, mm -hmm. and it's the same thing with a lot of the comments um, that you've gotten on alternate articles. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, even recently, it's so although the casual sort of thing, I don't know if you saw the speech that uh, the president made recently, um, trying to be inclusive, and yes. this is the real irony, and in trying to be inclusive, he excluded us. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. He's trying to be, well, this is, this is sort of one of my, the largest bees in my bonnet. And I have a lot of bees in my bonnet. <laughs> I have a very large hive of, of bees in my bonnet. Um, uh, but one of them has to do with this progressive ecumenicalism. Uh, and I have found that people, in, who are progressive ecumenicalists, uh, people who are, you know, I'm a Christian, you're a Jew, you're a Wiccan, you're a Hindu, you know, but we can all get along and we're all worshiping the same God in different ways. And, you know, oh, isn't that interesting that you think God is an elephant with a hundred arms? And isn't it interesting that I think God is a, you know, dead, burning bush. Is a burning bush or a, you know, you know, this carpenter who got crucified 2,000 years ago. Um, and th there's a couple of things. One is that I think, and, and, and I've gotten some of the ugliest anti-atheist remarks made to me by people from that world. Um, and I've had people call me a fascist. I've had people compare me to Glenn Beck. I've had people call me really ugly personal names uh, who, are co who are people who, as you say, they're generally extremely politi politically progressive and they're extremely tolerant. They're very good at this, you know, hand-holding, let's all get along kumbaya thing. And yet when it comes to atheists, they're very hostile. And I do find that a little bit baffling, but I think that it comes from a couple of different places. Some of it is, again, that we're new. You know, they're not used to us, and that's just something that's going to get better with time. Um, um, but I also think that the, again, we have to accept this, that you know, the religious, you know, the people in this ecumenical, this progressive liberal ecumenical world, they're all saying, well, we're all worshiping the same God in the same way, or in different ways. We're all worshiping the same God, but it's different ways. We just have different ways of coming at it. And atheists are coming at it and saying, no, you're not. First of all, you have major differences between you. And second of all, there is no God. And we think you're all mistaken. You know, you can't all be right, but you can all be wrong. And, uh, and, and the thing is that within this ecumenical world, there is this understanding that you don't ask hard questions. There's this understanding that's considered extremely rude. At, that's, a, that, that's a mild way of putting it. It's considered rude at best and intolerant and bigoted at worst to, to point out flaws in other people's religion, to point out gee, you know, this isn't consistent. Your holy text says this over here, but it says this other thing over here. And uh, there's really no evidence, you know, you believe that the you know, Jewish carpenter was God, but there's no, not a whole lot of good evidence that he even existed. And, um, you know, these books all contradict each other and they were written decades later. And, uh, you know, those kinds of, they don't ask hard questions of one another about their faith. That's considered to be breaking the, the rules of ecumenicalism. The whole idea is you're supposed to be respectful of each other's faith and respect uh, of each other's faith means not asking those questions. And what they see is they see there as, as being two options. There's the polite kumbaya hand-holding, we're never going to ask each other hard questions. Or there's gross religious intolerance where you're, you know, banning people and, you know, burning churches or burning synagogues and, um, you know, Stalin and, the, you know, the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition, those are their two options that they see. And the atheist movement is coming along and saying there's a third option. We can respect 
you as people. We can respect your right to exist. We can ex respect your right to believe whatever you want to. We can respect your right to practice whatever religion you want to. And yet, we can ask hard questions about it. We can treat your religion as a hypothesis about the world. We can treat your religion as one idea among many about how the world works and why it is the way it is, and ask, is this a hypothesis that stands up? And uh, and that's a really different model. And I think that that's something that progressive ecumenical people are not used to. And again, I think it's just going to take time. OK. Looks like we have a call. Uh, Aaron? Aaron, are you there? Hey, yes, sir, I am. Uh, what have you got for us today? Uh, well, like I was telling uh, your, your call screener, um, I was looking for a podcast, for Yelp's podcast today to listen to at work. And I looked up Ask an Atheist on my phone. and. Y'all didn't have a new one, but under it was the Atheist Handbook, and I thought that was going to be something interesting for me to listen to, like some, some, more, some more insights about atheism and uh, atheism in general. And I downloaded all the episodes, and what it is actually is uh, a, a, quote, handbook on how to debate atheists oh. as a yeah. Christian. And <laughs> I, I, I listened to the first, the first little, I don't know what you want to call it, they call it a chapter, and and just some of the some of this guy's rhetoric was so ridiculous that the whole he said God didn't create evil people created evil and he can't stop evil because that would mean killing people so instead of maybe taking one person's life to save a couple million he just lets the million die because otherwise it'd be wrong to take one life and I, I was listening to this and it, it made no sense to me at all no, it doesn't at so all I, no I skipped ahead to the uh, the, the science one, and the first thing that he says is he, he equated scientists with uh, psychics. And oh, you gotta be kidding he said, me. No, no. He, he said psychics document themselves as proving that, proving that they've, they've divined the future. And he said, well, that's what scientists do because it's their job. So they have to say that they, they got this right because otherwise they'd be out of a job. Well, what's and with them I, in prophecy, I, though? I mean, isn't that essentially what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just aghast at what this man was saying. And then he said, um, oh, man, what did he say? He said, um, yeah, I guess oh, he, also, he also said um, people that uh, make theories are just making, every, everything they say about a theory is just made up. They're That's, just making it up on the fly. I always just find it hilarious when people basically, uh, well, thank you for your call. I, just, I find it hilarious that people basically project what they're doing. Exactly. On other people, mm -hmm. and it's clear that mm -hmm. some of these people have never actually talked mm -hmm. to an intelligent atheist before. Um, otherwise, they'd realize, I mean, oh, he can't kill one person, but what about all the people that he killed in Sodom and Gomorrah? Mm -hmm. What about <laughs> all the people he commanded to be <laughs> killed, let nothing breathe, live? <laughs> that isn't consistent. No. What I think is interesting is the way that uh, a lot of times people will attack atheism by saying it's just like religion. You know, they'll say, oh, it's just a matter of faith and, you know, you, you, you can't be any more certain that God doesn't exist that, than that God does exist, so therefore it's just a matter of faith, so therefore it's just like religion. Well, obviously we can deflate that by saying you don't need 100% certainty, uh, you know, we're just, you know, we're coming to a provisional conclusion based on the available evidence. If we see better evidence, we'll change our mind, etc. But what I think is really interesting is you're attacking atheism by saying that it's like religion, so therefore what's so great about religion? Yes. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's weird because I, I think a lot of it is that a lot of people like this have this, an inability to see a different, a different template. They have this, this very clear template where this is my God, this is my Messiah or prophet, or this is my book. And they simply want to swap out the names for atheists. They just mm -hmm. simply can't understand that somebody doesn't use that template. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, your book is on the origin of species. Your God is science. Mm -hmm. And Darwin is your prophet. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's so weird because it's so clear that I think they're just so unable to see somebody else who just has, it. like you said, that third option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but yeah, the, the same thing with fundamentalists is, and I, I, we want to do an episode of this at some point, but what are the fundamentals aside from a lack of belief in one thing? Well, yeah, it's like whenever people say that, you know, oh, you know, atheists and, you know, there's a, all these atheist fundamentalists running around. And I always want to say, so what is the book that we are supposedly f literally interpreting? Um, you know, and, you know, what they mean is they, they want to use fundamentalist uh, to mean, I guess, extremist or to mean, I don't know, they're not very clear about it. Uh, they seem to want to, to use the word fundamentalist to mean extremist or to mean just somebody who's very passionate about what they think. Uh, but 
it's it's like you know you look you know fundamentalist. It means fundamentals. It means you would you know literally strictly adhere to some text. And it's like, well, what's what's the text? I don't know. Yeah. I I've never <laughs> seen it. Um, and it's weird because they'll always try to say something like, you know, it's on the origin of species or Mein mm -hmm. Kampf, which is mm -hmm. weird because they clearly aren't interested in, in being intellectually honest, where, I mean, no. the Hitler one is just mm -hmm. especially bad because not only did he profess his Catholicism all the time, but mm -hmm. the SS had God mit us on their belt. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he was clearly a creationist in the book. He denounced these sort of things. It's just, it, it, it's weird because how do, you, how do you argue with somebody who's dead set on not caring if the claims they make correspond with reality. Well, that's a, that's a question I have a lot. Is and it's not just uh, hardliners either. It's not just the right wing fundamentalists who do that. Um, I get into a lot of debates with uh, very again very progressive religious believers, with you know progressive Christians, with New Age believers, people who practice Wicca and you know these sort of New Age beliefs, and um, and they'll come out right out of the gate and say, you're relying too much on reason, you're relying too much on evidence, and it's not fair to subject religion to, to questions of reason and evidence. And, you know, it's this other realm, it's the non-overlapping magisteria, it's this whole other realm of knowing, it's this whole other way of knowing. And, right, and right. it's a good question, is how do you debate with people, how do you engage with people who don't care about evidence, who don't care about reason? And I've been running into people who will actually say, I don't care whether what I believe is true. Yeah. And what what do you say to that? <laughs> know. You know, what on earth do you say to somebody who says I don't care what I believe is true? But uh, I think that one of the things we need to remember when we're engaging in these conversations, especially when we're doing it in a public forum, if we're doing it in on a blog, if we're doing it in a comment thread, if we're doing it in an online forum of some sort, is that the people who we're trying to convince are not necessarily the people that we're talking to. Absolutely. We're not. It's the people, other people who are listening in. It's the other people who are on the sidelines, who are kind of on the fringes. Um, you know, it's there's no magic formula for how do you convince somebody who doesn't care about evidence and reality. Um, yeah, I've, I've had that same thing, and that's why I've, I've stopped having private arguments with people like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. That if you're going to debate them at all, you have to have some kind of an audience because I'm not going to convince, say, Ray Comfort that he's yeah. wrong about anything. <laughs> I mean, he's got a vested financial interest in in, yeah. in this. There's no way, like you said, he's in that same place. But even if I did convince him. And I did shoot out his argument, he would lose everything he had. Yes. So, I mean, he would be giving up everything. Mm -hmm. um, but I can debate somebody like that in front of an audience. And if then there might be somebody who's up in the air, somebody who mm -hmm. thinks they're the only person that feels what this person mm -hmm. is saying is ridiculous, they think they're alone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and certainly, you know, a hand, there are a handful of people who, you know, look at somebody like Dan Barker, um, who was very committed. He was a, a he was a preacher, and he was a very fundamentalist preacher, and he did he came out into atheism. Um, so clearly, it is possible in some cases to persuade people. I think something else, but it's but it's not common. I think something else we need to remember when we're engaging in d debates and discussions with people is that persuading people doesn't always happen right away. Uh, certainly, you know, I I had religious beliefs for many years that I eventually let go of, and it's not like I read this one argument. It's not like I read one article in Skeptical Inquirer that's like, oh well, obviously this doesn't make any sense. Uh, it can take time. It's sort of like water on rock, and you know, so you may not be convincing somebody in that particular argument, but but you may sort of be putting the little chink of doubt in there. And that's where I think what we need really need to do, what atheists need to do, is we need to not just be making arguments, but we need to be building a stronger community. We need to be building a, a safe place for people to come out into when they do leave religion. Because one of the things I run into in a lot of my discussions with believers is you can back them logically into a corner where anybody, any rational person would be, they'd say, okay, fine, I give up, you're right. Uh, but because they're very committed to their religious beliefs, they're emotionally committed to it, they may be financially committed to it, they have friends and family who are in it, or they're just, they don't want to believe that they're going to die. And that's a hard one. It's, it's, they, they want to believe that they're going to live forever with their friends in the sky. And we need to do a better job, I think, 
of not just encouraging people to come out, but of providing a safe place for people to come out into, providing a community and providing a positive humanist philosophy, uh, doing more at disseminating our, well, it's like, we don't believe we're gonna live forever, ever, but we think that that's okay. This is why we think death is okay. Uh, this is how we create meaning for ourselves, even though God hasn't given it to us. Uh, so I think that one of the things we really need to do is not just try to get at those chinks in the logical armor of their beliefs, but make it clear that atheism is okay.